Hi, Mark. Thank you for joining me again for part two, uh, the sequel. Hopefully it's one of the good sequels like Aliens or T2 or Empire Strikes Back. Uh, we talked about a lot of things in part one and anyone listening to this first should go back to part one to get more context. But we were left with, I think, a lot more to say. So today we're going to try to go over a bunch of things. I had a little kind of intro first I want to get out of the way because I've been thinking a lot about this and we discussed a lot about the psychology of everything surrounding nuclear power and energy in general. And I kind of see it as how humans are very tribal like it's just part of us and so you see these energy tribes right people need a team to root for so you know people from a certain part of the world where there's a lot of that will root for coal or for oil and some you know maybe more techie people will go for nuclear and more you know romantic greens or even techie people will go for for solar and wind because it's a new thing right I try to look at all these things as just tools and they all have pros and cons and trade-offs and I think coal was amazing for humanity because it got us to where we are and there was not much else at the time that we could have used to get the same effect, right? 200 years ago, we weren't going to build a nuclear power plant and the coal and gas were also almost magical in getting humanity very far forward and giving us plenty of energy. So I'm trying to look at it as just how can we keep the upsides of all this abundance of energy and mitigate the downsides. I just want a better future for our civilization and, you know, make rational decisions. So from my kind of business background, my investing background, I'm looking at nuclear as kind of very, a very undervalued stock, right? If everybody was selling all the time, it was perfect. The answer to everything, I may you know, point out some of the flaws or the problems or the downsides. But right now it's kind of like so far in the other direction that that's why I may seem like someone who's on team nuclear or just like waving the flag as a totally sold for it. But I, I would just want to give this intro to talk about how that's not how I'm trying to see it internally, even if it sounds like I'm just like waving the nuclear flag all the time. So long intro, but what can we talk about today? Well, I reject almost all of that. Awesome. I'm curious why. Here's what I mean. Is food just rational fuel that we put in our body so we can move about the day and do other things? Maybe it's rational fuel so we can just go online and be irrational about energy. I don't know. But no, of course not. Food is not just human fuel. Absolutely. It's feasts. It's important dinners with a beloved partner. It's a, a first taste of freedom when you make your first travel overseas by yourself as a young man or woman, right? Yeah. It's uh, nationalism. There's a famous quote. I'm trying to remember who is it, Orwell, George Orwell, that nationalism is little more than people wanting to eat the foods they ate as a child. Is that rational or not? Because the calories matter. You can't stay alive without it. Too many and you become obese and maybe you have health issues. But you, you see my point. Why should the power sources not be just as emotional? I agree. I, I think they can be more than one thing at a time, right? I think food can be a bunch of nutrients that you decompose into the building blocks of it. But it's also a bunch of other like, you know, more romantic things, more psychological thing, more cultural things. So I agree can be all that. I agree power and has all these things let too. Let me push I just, further. Yeah, let me push further. It turns out that those emotional connections to food True, they can be hijacked by clever marketing or by maybe the food business pushing in one way or another. But those emotions often have valuable long-term health advantages. Even the cycling of foods through seasons, the seasonality of food. It's a subject talked about frequently by Nassim Chalib, for example, where religious prescriptions and prescriptions on diets end up having some amount of possibly beneficial dietary effect over the long term. Not that you must prove it with science to do something you believe in or enjoy or yep. gives you meaning, just it turns out that emotions can be very fast reactions that when added up over a long period of time have a protective or beneficial role. And I think that possibly one of the downsides of the way we've managed large complicated systems like electricity is we've removed emotions from just the areas where they might have been excellent downside protection against unusual or unexpected events. If I must give an example, how about this? Economists said that electricity is just a commodity like any others. It's traded back and forth between borders. Some countries have a competitive advantage in energy. Some have a competitive advantage in electricity. Why shouldn't Germany, the industrial heart of Europe, get its energy based on which country has the cheaper or more expensive? Germany can get its cheap energy from other countries, namely Russia, and then convert it into high value products using its industrial advantages and its technology advantages, its incredible labor force at home. Why, what's, what's the problem with that? 
Well, I would argue that the emotion of maybe you should just make your own because it's just better to do it because of German pride or something. I think that that may have been a little bit valuable. I think that pushing back on economists who wanted to abstract out geopolitical realities from the grid and the way we manage it, the way we plan it now, I think that was a huge error. And I think a little bit more emotion could have served us well. Certainly, the people fighting against nuclear energy were using plenty of emotion. They were just coming up against weak, brittle, emotionless technocrats who were easily persuaded. I agree. I agree with everything you've said. I suspect we both agree we're just looking at it from a different angle, right? So the rational angle for Germany would have been you don't want to depend on you know, a dictator, a potential enemy, on people outside of your borders. So that part can be gotten to from the more emotional side, nationalistic side, or it can be gotten to from a more like, you know, strategic thinking, rational side. But I think... And guess what? Guess how we decide which to choose. That's right. Emotions, not rationality. In other words, I reject this framework. I reject this framework almost entirely that there's the rational self or the irrational. Because with, when you say rational or irrational, you must ask, rational for whom? Over what time period? Considering what known or unknown possibilities? And in order to venture into the murky unknown, the fog of a future war, the, the decision to do that is fundamentally an emotional one or even an, an aesthetic one. I agree. I think that's a large part of the problem for nuclear is the industry has been pretty bad at giving the right emotions to people, right? At explaining itself and at showing itself as the thing that provides a bunch of good things for society rather than the anti-nuclear people who have associated with nuclear holocaust and all these negative things and all these emotions are what comes up. So yeah, I, I agree that's what at the end of the day will end up generating the decisions. If the correct numbers, the correct mathematics, the correct long-term downside protecting factors are not tied with emotions worthy of them, then the emotions tied to long tail risk and incorrect numbers and blinding hateful ideology, those things will win. So let's do that in this segment. Let's use a bit of our emotions and just tie them to uh, better material. If you decide to root for a certain hockey team or basketball team, right? Nobody can convince you to change teams. It's purely emotional. In the case of infrastructure, hopefully some numbers come in at some point. And I don't want to be part of the people who have picked a team and then never looked at the numbers of the other teams or never looked at the, the downsides of my own team. But now we're getting better because you happen to be from a team in Quebec that has fundamentally rejected nuclear energy as something that, you know, the rest of Canada may yeah. do. Though I, as a caveat, I would just say that I don't see myself as like the collective Quebec, right? I'm very different from my neighbors, from other people. So just to be clear, I don't necessarily believe everything that my government or people here say, but go ahead. And you understand how that could be a disadvantage if you're needing to convince others who do believe that way or do see that way, yep. that their interests, especially long-term interests, are best served by occasionally rooting for the other team. Yep. So that's our challenge. How did we get into this uh, European energy crisis as a subportion of the global energy crisis because the European energy crisis is very bad. It's almost like one of the richest block of countries in the world yep. is now facing the day-to-day -day realities of the poor countries whose energy systems they have declined to fund. Yeah, it's incredible how if you had told someone a few years ago how bad things are today, they wouldn't have believed you that things could deteriorate so quickly. You know, you read about Germany selling out of firewood and fireplaces and like that, it's getting really bad. If we're unlucky and the next winter as certain conditions combine, like very cold and like not much wind and very cloudy and this and that, depending on how the war goes and what Russia does. And like, if all these things aligned in the wrong way, it could be terrible, cataclysmic, right? I'm, I'm probably going to be your least agreeable guest ever because I'm going to disagree <laughs> with what you said. If I love that. even one of those factors you mentioned goes the wrong way, it could cause what you just said. Very, very bad downer slide. If they all line up, I don't know. At that point, it's a divide by zero. It's somewhere between societal collapse and somehow all pulling together in some immense fashion to figure out how to build nuclear plants in two years. And how did it get so bad, right? Because Europe has all the pieces to have a tremendous infrastructure. They had tons of nuclear power plants to begin with. They had the potential to do fracking, which they decided not to. How did we 
get here, right? Is, is it purely like some Machiavellian plan from Russia, like influencing uh, German politicians and NGOs and trying to align everything so that they're so dependent on Nord Stream and, and such? Is it purely some of the anti-nuclear movements like being so successful? Or uh, I'm curious, what's your kind of overview of how we got from there to here? How far should we zoom out? How weird should we get? <laughs> Because I... One of the reasons, Liberty, that I'm obsessed with ancient history, obsessed with it, is because as much as we ever can, we can see the results. We don't know the results of the things we do today. We can right. guess at them, we can imagine them, but if you go far enough back, you can see for a fact what did occur. And as the work of historians expands, as the work of archaeologists and historical climatologists expands, we can know more and more about the conditions being faced by people with certain levels of uh, agency, certain levels of decision-making capacity, certain cultures. So I'm particularly obsessed with ancient Egypt. And of course, ancient Egypt proves you can do marvelous things based on nothing but renewable energy. So don't let anyone tell you you can't. I mean, after all, the pyramids were built entirely through sustainable methods. So where I'm going with this is that Egypt had almost the same amount of people at the point that it stopped making great pyramids as at the point that it was making the biggest ones. Did it lose the capability? Let me even put a, put a finer point on this. After the three great pyramids at Giza were built, Egypt never again moved even the tiniest fraction of that amount of stone in the rest of the 2,500 years of the Pharaonic civilization. They built those pyramids further in time from Cleopatra and the end of the Pharaonic system compared to where we are today. What happened that turned their attention away? Was there a collapse? Did they just lose the technology to build in such extraordinary fashion? That Did they lose the engineering? Well, at first, it seems that their focus and the tension turned to other things. They started building pyramids that were nearly as beautiful, but were not made of stone cores, or they were not made of tightly fitted, precision engineered stone cores. So within a few centuries, I would imagine a few decades for the unlucky pyramids, these giant structures would start crumbling and fade away. Even mm -hmm. though the exteriors, by all the things we could tell, were just as finely and beautifully made as the exteriors once were of the Great Pyramids. It's just the focus and attention and eventually the abilities of the court switched to different areas. At some point, even if they had wanted to rebuild pyramids, they could not have. Right, it's like civilizational capabilities as muscles, right? They atrophy if you don't use them for a while. Right, so the question that we're about to have answered for us over the next few years is, can we take this century, maybe 130 year long contiguous experiment of the grid, can we maintain it? Can we keep it up? Can we expand it? We don't know for sure, because it was the product of an almost continuous series of successful construction efforts, property rights arranged in such a way that you could build out the grid, that you could make sure you had enough power plants, that you arranged for enough fuel, that you arranged for enough, enough customers and load growth and things like that. And a lot of the ways that we made electricity work were intentionally changed, broken, if you will, about 20, 25, 30 years ago. And we are now coming to the conclusion where we broke down the traditional way of building enough power plants intentionally, and a new way of doing it correctly has not emerged. It looks like the war in Ukraine has made a lot of things happen very quickly on that front, at least when it comes to politicians like claiming we're going to do X, as far as you know, shovels in the ground and things being built, all these projects take so long. Is there a way to regain those capabilities? You think if you had to place odds, right, bet on it, What are you seeing that's going in the right directions in Europe? And what's, what are you seeing that's just pure denial? And Well, here's one. European countries are, are, or at least the leaders that I'm seeing talking about European energy, are still talking as if this will be a one winter crisis or maybe one season, right? They fail to understand that this is a crisis that will be continuous every year from now on. They fail to understand this. In some ways, I can empathize. They just have to get through this winter, right? Just through this winter. But do you think that the Germans selling out of firewood is a sustainable thing? You think that they'll only need it for this winter? Do you think that the amount of trees left in Europe is enough hmm. for getting energy wrong? No, it's not. Europe's trees, the ones that are still there, and Germany regrew, it, regrew its forests much less than other countries. 
That's another thing to keep in mind. And there are several factors that are influencing this. But even forests didn't matter as a discussion point in Europe. Certainly, they weren't connected to energy. That was a triumph of electricity. That was a triumph of energy provision, modern energy provision, that let us forget about the forests of Europe and just hope that they grew back. And, and they did. In many, many countries in Europe, woodlands were returning, partly through the devaluing of agricultural land, but also partly through no longer needing it to heat. Yeah. The plan right now, from what I can see, seems to be, okay, let's restart some coal plants. Um, let's try to get some LNG terminals. Let's try to temporary, get... temporary restart of coal plants just for this year, not future <laughs> years, just this one, right? Yeah, temporary. Oh boy. In, until the Russians turn the gas back on. Yes. And they haven't even decided to extend the life of their last remaining three nuclear power plants in Germany. Well, wait, no, no, no. They're thinking about it. Maybe a few months or whatever until the energy crisis is done. I guess that's a denial part that I was talking about. It's incredible that e even at this point, if they still have three working plants and they have this this huge tidal wave like coming right at them, like this huge crisis, why do you think they just can't bring themselves to? Is, is it Green Party having a hold on things? Is it the emotional stuff that we we're talking about? Like the, the whole of Germany is just not just doesn't want it, right? You could show them all of the maths and it doesn't matter. They, they've decided that they, they move past nuclear and that's it. I, I just Liberty, can't understand. <laughs> Liberty, what's the value? What's the value of old people? What has Nassim Tlaib wisely said about the value of old people in human society? It's to remember how high the water gets. Yep. It's also to remember how low the water gets. The old people that we have in charge of Europe including the young old people, they don't know how high or low the water gets. They don't understand and they don't have any working intuitions about energy on a quantity scale. They also don't have working intuitions about energy on a substitution scale. That's why we keep hearing in Germany, they say, oh, well, you see, um, natural gas is not needed for electricity in our country. So bringing more nuclear electricity back doesn't help us with natural gas. These are the same people who have spent years saying we must electrify all heating. Right. But this year, because they are looking for reasons to still shut down nuclear, they forget all the things they just said about the substitutability of electricity for gas heat. Here's another one. They say we've got to bring the coal plants on just now, just for now, to replace natural gas. Well, but nuclear, as everyone knows, directly also competes with coal for electricity. But they forget that part in order to make the instant correct judgments to bring back every power plant that they've got fuel for but they don't extend that knowledge. So again, there's a very segmented knowledge indicating they're just bullshitting constantly. They're just improvising constantly. And their advisors are the ones who push them, who help push or it. Let's say they gave stamps of approval to really horrible directions. And these are the technical experts at the cusp of either saving or losing their careers. So of course they're gonna only give the little parts at a time needed by the leaders to do what they wanted to do anyway. So there's an entire ecosystem of incompetency in the leadership and incompetency in the degree and salary technical staff. They've all got to go. They've all just got to go. Sooner the better, but we'll see what happens this winter. And from the outside, it seems to me like Germany is in the worst position, but is it all connected? Like, uh, how, how's the UK? Germany is absolutely not in the worst position. They have a much more orderly and competent society than many other nations. So who do you see being in the worst position? How do you see kind of the interconnectedness and the dominoes falling if things go wronger? The UK right? is in the worst position. Really? Okay. Yeah. Can you explain why? Sure. Because they're already, uh, all the meat is gone. They're down to the bone already. Like the fat's gone, the meat's gone. They're down to the bone for much of the population. So they're coming into this crisis in a worse state. But unlike Italy or Spain, they haven't been there for a generation, shall we say. Hmm. I'm generalizing heavily based on lots of discussions, looking at the numbers. In the case of the UK, traveling there pretty extensively and working and studying there for, for several years, right? Here's another thing. The Brits have made their fortune and their reputation on enforcing deals and doing what they say they're going to do. They make their money on finance, right? Their countries around them don't necessarily claim to do that. And if they get into a desperate crisis, they will break their contracts earlier than Britain would to protect their interests. But since Britain is the one who made its money on deal making rather than supplying the raw ingredients of society, supplying the machines that made the machines, supplying the machines themselves, supplying the energy to run those things. I mean, it did have an oil and gas industry that's declining, 
and it does have some wind turbines, but everyone else has wind turbines that run or don't run at the same time, Liberty. They all kind of are connected to one big weather pattern over about a billion people, hmm. small land area in Europe, yeah? So Britain has fewer backups, fewer safety systems, and an economy much more built on correct legal executing of contracts as written. I know this sounds like a weird focus, but as far back as 2013, when I first started hearing about the coming British energy collapse, they were, I was already hearing important people in the government, not in, important like being listened to, but in <laughs> roles that in a correct world should be very important and given great deal of formal and informal power. So like the head of the Office of Gas and Electricity Markets, that should be a really important position. If you decide to turn over state survival related things like gas supply and electricity supply over to the market, your head of the market operator should be like a god, right? But instead, they're just ignorable. People don't even know their names. I can't even find the head guy on LinkedIn when I search for his name. When I try to uncover this speech that was powerful, shocking, and horrifying back in 2013, what was this speech? It was to a tiny audience at my college at Cambridge, Pember College, just in a little room over, you know, decent but not great wine. And he just told a small audience that Britain was going to run out of wiggle room by about 2016 or 17, the winter of 2017, say. And if things went wrong in 2018 and 19 and no course corrections were made by about 18, 2018 and 19, each winter would be a gamble for survival every single winter. I'm not as familiar with the UK grid as some others and maybe the listener isn't. So if you had to describe why they're in such bad shape, what's kind of like the composition and how did it get worse over the past 10 years, right? Let me just make it simple. It's natural gas and wind hmm. and the wind can stop for weeks at a time. And the natural gas storage is about three days for the country. How much of their natural, natural gas are they getting from their own fields and from outside, right? They're probably in pretty big decline in the, the North Sea. What a terrible situation to be in. Shall we make it worse? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, even then, their balance comes from imported electricity. Now, when their wind is blowing well, when their own demand is relatively low, they're exporting. Amazing. It's commerce. It's trade, right? Liberty, that's, that's extraordinary. Adam Smith would be proud. Ricardo would be, would be delighted. But the thing is, you don't survive in the long run by surviving on average. You yeah. do it by getting through each month each day and on the grid each second each second is a discrete thing on the grid there's a rolling one second time period if we want to be poetic and talking about it that you are surviving constantly and then forever it's like a heartbeat electricity is one of the most sophisticated and wondrous systems we have ever made economists don't understand it so they abstracted out the parts that make it work and then said now we have an image of it in econ language and then they broke it Yeah, as Buffett would say, you never want to multiply by zero. But Or they say, wow, it's just unimaginable if event X happens, <laughs> so that won't happen. Okay, let's deal with the other events. Hmm. Yeah, this modeling and this, oh, it's a Six Sigma event and all this stuff that keeps happening all the time and just showing that the models are, are terrible and we, we can't do probabilities well. So instead of focusing on mit making the thing as, as resilient as possible to anything, right, They try to model the, the center of the bell curve and, oh, that'll be good enough. Yeah, so they model, they look at the system. They're like, oh, I guess it's like power plants compete against each other. That sounds good enough. And then it turns out that some power plants have attributes that are necessary for the grid to stay up. When those power plants close because the market wasn't based on those attributes, it was based on other attributes, then they say, oh, well, oh, oh, the grid has that in it. Oh, good to know. We'll invent another market for that purpose. And then they, they do this ad hoc adding of market mechanisms. And it's like so many astrologers or early astronomers trying to add complications to the geocentric model to keep it alive. <laughs> this, is, this is what it feels like to me. Except it's not a danger of inventing powerful telescopes and then getting embarrassed. It's a danger of the very things that make it possible for this number of people to live in a certain degree of grace and dignity all at one time. It's a breakdown in that. Yeah, you tweeted about people claiming the baseload is dead. How can, how can people even think that you don't need baseload plants, right? What, what's the argument there? there it's, by, it's by doing this. Deciding either based on emotions or evidence that renewable energy is the way forward. Then, once renewable energy is the way forward, you realize that it's devastating for renewable financing if you can't get first priority on the grid. Hmm. Then, if you see that renewables must get first priority in the peaks and the troughs, you realize that 
a power plant that must make its revenue by constant operation or at least mild up and uh, ups and downs that there's no room for a plant with those economics of running it all the time and recouping a bit of money all the time hmm. there's no room for that so you define out the need using marketing language and wishful thinking even though physically the need remains as we're seeing in europe yeah you start with the answer and then you backfill in the logic to get there Yeah, and since you never actually understood the underlying system and you only learned about the system one little bit at a time because of an emerging crisis with your previous understanding, that's how you can get that logic and trap yourself in that direction. I'm just a civilian, right? I'm just interested in energy in the grid as an outsider. But I feel like a huge step in my understanding has been when I went from looking at all these technologies as separate things, right? Oh, solar is cool because of this. Let's study the NREL list of the, the efficiency records and blah, blah, blah. Okay. All these technologies separately are interesting in themselves, but not enough people, I feel like, make the jump of looking at it as a system, right? Systems thinking how all of this connects together over large grids and over like countries and continents and... And large periods of time. Also, because like a period of a few years of cheap natural gas doesn't mean that natural gas will be cheap forever, right? But if you close down all of your other plants and then you get to an expensive period... as So like, maybe we say this. This is the way we'd say it if we wanted to use FinTwit slang. European civilization did a YOLO short on natural <laughs> gas, and now there's a squeeze. They thought natural gas was cheap forever, and so you right. can make money against the fools who thought that it wouldn't be cheap forever. And now there's a squeeze. And it is a squeeze. Look at the charts of the natural gas connected baseload price of energy going up in Europe. Yeah, and the thing is, this isn't just finance, right? This is geopolitics, this is war. People are dying, right? It's everything. Because once you convert, that's the horror in the UK. Coal is really expensive right now, but at least it's not the same item. It's not the same product coming through the same pipes as natural gas. Meaning if you have a natural gas disruption, it does not cut out both the natural gas heating and industry and electricity at the same time. Right. The UK YOLO'd on the same fuel for both electricity and heating and, and industry. Yeah, and you give up your sovereignty partly because how can you make independent decisions when Putin could turn off the gas, right? Soft power is looking awfully mushy right now, in other words. Yeah. All right. Well, now I'm depressed about Europe. I already was. So but should I'm we even... try to find ways to be optimistic about the 2030s? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's try to bring some sunshine in or some uh, sure. gamma rays. Or... Let's do it. So the, the magic is nuclear plants take up tiny little plots of land and you can store up 10 years of fuel in a few months lead time right next to the plant. In a little bitty shed. It's right. a miracle. How convenient yeah. would it be if we had those right now, right? Yeah, wouldn't it be? And people constantly throw it in my face. When I talk about Germany's world-leading nuclear plants, they're like, oh, no, this energy crisis is because the French can't manage theirs. To, to which I say, that is the entire point. The Germans are destroying by choice what they manage spectacularly by culture. Yeah. The French chose to exercise the worst parts of their cultural deficiencies on the nuclear fleet. Yeah, that's my understanding too. It's like Germany had some of the very, very best nuclear plants in the world, best run. The, like if France's fleet was run like Germany's and Germany's was as big as France, right? How different would the situation be right now? Exactly. So I'm here in Cleveland visiting family and I found a coffee mug in the cabinet. And if you'll humor me, Sure. I'll read it to you. Heaven is where the police are British, the chef's Italian, the mechanic's German, the lover's French, and it's all organized by the Swiss. <laughs> Hell is where the chefs are British, the mechanic's French, the lover's Swiss, the police German, and it is all organized by the Italians. <laughs> so, Liberty, I'm afraid we have a situation in Europe where the energy policy, it, we could write up in that, where if... The French, the recent French turnaround to love nuclear, if that were the way the Germans were, but the French nuclear plants were run by Germans, we would be talking much less about an energy crisis now. In fact, we'd still be needing to justify the existence of nuclear plants, which now at the moment self-justify. You see the problem here? You see the necessity of emotions, even religious belief in not doing stupid things for the long term that are smart in the short term? Yeah, that's the thing. When things are going well, they kind of fade in the background and people forget that they still have to kind of, you know, explain it and educate and defend it and be on the ball to not let someone else define the kind of brand, right? The framing of the thing 
And I think that's kind of what happened in France for a while. But so let's talk about Europe's future if we get through this period. The 30s, if what people are starting to talk about now happens, right? Because you never know. But what are we looking at, right? Is there a chance for Germany? Uh, I know France has said some things about building more. I think the UK too. Uh, is it Belgium and the Netherlands looking at nuclear too? Like it, it seems to be a, a huge turnaround for Europe, but not at the right time. We're in a weird moment where countries that still have phase out policies in law and France has a law saying they have to turn off, they have to get rid of a bunch of their nuclear output. It, it's still in the books. No matter what Macron says about building, France still has a law saying they have to dramatically cut their nuclear output. I mean, I can't miss the irony that they're achieving it just in a bumbling, humiliating Uh, shambolic fashion, not the intentional destruction of... They're not intentionally destroying their resources now. They're just unintentionally doing it exactly according to the law. Can you believe this? It's it's what? It's August 2022, a year after this energy crisis started, and the French nuclear phase down is still in the law. Okay, let's move to Belgium. Let's move to Belgium. Belgium is starting for the first time to think about adding little reactors, they're still scheduled to shut down their large reactors, all of them. It is in the law to get rid of 50% of the nation's electricity in the next two and a half years. And do you know what the replacement is supposed to be, Liberty? Probably gas. Essentially 100% natural gas. Well, not just that, also... Wind and solar? Imports from the other countries having horrible energy crises. (laughs) I don't know the politics of Belgium. Is it kind of similar to... Germany and France? Is it just like, you know, we don't like nuclear, so let's just shut it down. But is is it purely politics? No, it's a colossal, confused goat rodeo. It is a giant clown circus. It's uh, it took them 500 days to form a government out of Mm. seven minor parties. Oh, right. After the last elections. So they horse traded nuclear somewhere in there. And yeah. So you know how crystals can form in a super saturated solution once you have a seed, a little seed and then it starts to form. So the Green Party saying we care about nothing else other than shutting down nuclear plants. So we need the energy ministry. That's what was the seed crystal for the recent government, as I'm told by my Belgian contacts. Hmm. You know, we almost have to, because we're not going to get heat from actual energy sources in Europe, we have to get our joy the old fashioned way from jokes and stories (laughs) and tall tales and mythology. I'm just trying to get that started early. I'm depressed again now. I I thought this was the optimistic part. (laughs) But I'm saying it with such a grin on my face. I wish you had video in this so people could see that we were having a good time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move on to the Netherlands. The Netherlands, okay. one of the great gas producers, which shut down m- much of its gas production because of earthquakes. I'm not even saying they shouldn't have. It's just they sh- should have had a bunch of nuclear. So Netherlands has had a remarkable public attitude shift on nuclear. But now they actually have to do it, and they it will take some time. So on nuclear, they have one remaining reactor that they've decided to love and cherish forever and forever. That tiny little reactor, a a little baby, uh, what is it? A five hundred about a five hundred megawatt version of the giant reactors that Germany has. Same, basically the same design of Siemens design. It's a brilliant little plant. You can go inside of it during oper. You can go inside the containment during the operation of the reactor vessel. I've done it. It's wow. it's marvelous. The plant's humming with a quiet energy. I mean, the turbine hall is humming with an extremely loud energy, but it's just an incredible experience to go to that plant. Order, even simplicity, uh, even beauty. The protective clothing you put on just to, as a plant visitor is bright orange and it fits pretty well. I love it. So that's what the Dutch have. And that tiny little plant is making so much money that it alone could sponsor another nuclear program. Now that's bad. It's it, you, you shouldn't, I need to catch myself. If your nuclear plants are making cataclysmic piles of cash, you've made horrible decisions with your energy system. <laughs> Instead, nuclear plants should slowly and steadily pay themselves off five, 10 or 15 times over the course of a dignified 100, 120 year life. They should not print so much money that whatever entity is in charge of the nuclear plant becomes a new oil baron. That means you've, right. you're destroying industrial modernity if that happens. Think about this. In order for a nuclear plant to be making an immense amount of money, it means that either you did not anticipate being able to sell your power or you couldn't sell your power back when the prices were much lower and you might not have been able to stay alive. Why might you not have been able to stay alive? Because these damn electricity markets that said that if the wind comes on super strong today, 
and the price wholesale price plunges into the negative, but it doesn't matter to the wind turbine because they've sold their power forward to companies that need good ESG ratings or something. And they're also protected and given good priority and their own transmission and all these other goodies and surpluses at the expense of the existing system. Then all that market price does is says that the nuclear plant should pay a penalty for the privilege of existing during those hours if they're having to sell their electricity on the market. That's crazy. Who on earth could come up with such a stupid, idiotic system? Only ones with almost no understanding of history, of engineering, of people. It's just simply awful. And these are the these are the wraiths. These are the zombies that still haunt the halls of power all over Europe. They have got to be almost completely purged. You leave one or two as a punching bag to humiliate as an example to the others, and it serves as a training exercise for young economists. I think that would be a very important outcome this winter. I've accidentally got us back into the depressing stuff. Yeah, Where's yeah. the signs of promise? <laughs> Eastern Europe has a lot of coal. Heck, some Eastern European countries just straight up bought the coal infrastructure from Germany. That's still in Germany. It's just hmm. owned by Eastern Europe. That hopefully will produce an immense amount of money that will allow them to buy their own nuclear fleet based on having bought the quote unquote stranded assets that Germany said wasn't going to be in the plan because they were going to get off of coal and move to Russian natural gas. Is there the, even the capability to build up nuclear power plants in all these countries in parallel over the next 10 years? Like the, the number of engineers and the expertise and can we even have this kind of throughput of nuclear construction in Europe. It's a bit of a meta problem because before you build up nuclear in parallel, you need to build up the ability to build in parallel. So is that there now? N no, no. Is there some kind of wartime style mobilization that might be possible? I don't know. Maybe it will require a lot of people to switch career paths and uh, new talents that are being underused need to be discovered. Uh, an immense amount of German talent and abilities will be used outside of the current industries that use them in Germany. I mean, Germany will continue to be an incredibly capable and important part of this puzzle, even though they are as much as anybody, the reason we're in the mess that we are now. Hmm. So I am hopeful about human ingenuity when the pain is high enough. The pain is about to be high enough. If we can make it through the horrors and readjust our sense of like, you know, how brutal modern life should be, we may make a brighter, less brutal 2030s. Yeah, that's what's scary is even if you kind of, okay, you've decided on the, the answer to the problem, there's a gap in between where you need to build it. And that's, that's multiple years, right? That's the pain phase that we have to get through. How about we move on to something that may be less depressing, though I'm kind of skeptical there too. It's uh, SMRs. I'm going to give you context of my evolution on SMRs, right? So you hear about them, it's like, it's the next thing, right? It must be better. It must be cooler, right? It must be Nexus better in technology, usually. And then after a while, I kind of realized, well, okay, maybe it's just kind of like a, a financial thing, right? Maybe if we can't build the big ones right now, if you have a bite-sized thing that you can more easily get going and finance, uh, okay, but now I'm skeptical of that too, right? If it's almost as difficult to get a design approved and pass through regulators and it takes almost as long as bit to build. And then at the end, you have a much smaller reactor, like energies of scales are so important, it feels like with power plants that I'm not sure if, you know, this dream of like, oh, we're going to build them in factories and just plop them everywhere. Like you still have a lot of concrete to pour and even regular reactors are also built in factories. Anyway, you don't get so much improvement as well. Anyway, I'm pretty skeptical of SMRs. I'm curious, what's your view? You sound a bit like me. I started spreading those heresies about exactly two years ago. This month, I did my very first podcast ever, two mm. years ago. And it was also recorded here from Cleveland, from Family House. And it was about the marketing mumbo jumbo around so-called advanced nuclear and how much of it was only possible because of historical blindness and not even knowing what's done in the rest of the world. That is, a lot of the nuclear, the advanced nuclear industry is so divorced from actually existing nuclear that their marketing language is as bad as what you said. So let's tear this apart. Small modular reactor. How small is small? Well, small is uh, just however small you want it to be, you know? Some people use a definition of 300 megawatts and below. To give you a reference point, 300 megawatt barrier was broken by reactors being built in the mid 60s coming along online in the mid late 60s 300 megawatts started being small we still have brilliantly performing plants of 400 or 500 megawatts sometimes twin 500 
in the US, we have a few of those, built for a few hundred million in 2022 dollars uh, in four years. Hmm. So I guess maybe you could think that if you redefine small to be anything under 600 megawatts, then exactly copying what we used to do, it would be considered a small modular reactor now. Then, then there's the word modular. Let's talk about modular. There are small modular reactor proposals where aspects of the plant are modular, but other parts aren't. So if you have a semi non-modular power plant system, what does it mean to say the reactor is a module? That touches on what you said, which is another thing that I feel like I have to tell people all the time. What the competent, successful nuclear exporting countries do is that they make large modular reactors. What does that mean? It means since any nuclear plant is going to provide is going to provide a lot of laboring jobs for the local society, you build your big structures, you just do that, and then you install modules in the plant. People might say, no, a module is means that you have to like have it in a chunk and it has to drop down and plug and play. Well, look, nothing in the real world truly does plug and play the way you imagine. When the modules for the modular plant at Vogel in Georgia were being made, well, they made them and brought them to the site and they didn't pass inspection and they didn't fit. Hmm. So they were custom rebuilt on the spot as single one-time manufacturing efforts. Wow. In which case, what was the what was the point? As, especially when that's typically not the limiting factor in building your plant. It's weird little delays here and there, like uh, not being able to do your rebar properly or having some issue with paperwork on that or this. People want repeatability in language, so they get it in language, and it may not be delivered on the site. Furthermore, there can be really large units that are made with modular construction styles and the parts that are made in factories are, still are made in factories and are sent to the site like the steam generators or the reactor vessel all connected together with big pipes made in factories but if you don't construct the entire project manage the people manage the quality of the labor manage the documentation now the dream is you do all of that in a factory building or you do it repeatedly over and over but as you mentioned, the reality is nuclear plants are kind of going to take four to 10 years to construct, and then they're going to last for, what, 80, 100 years. The more you change, the less we can verify going into the project that the project will perform well day to day and last for an extremely long time. When I'm dealing with folks in positions of power and authority in developing countries who need a reactor, they often don't even want to hear a word about reactors that they cannot go visit and touch today, that they can't show their sovereign or their ruler or their president or, or their ministers. They need a reactor that they can go and show them and have a tour in. Right. Why? Because the closer you get to the responsibility of making a decision for which you will feel massive downside personally, the more conservative you get about changes here and there, innovations. Let someone else innovate. Maybe you'll do that for your next plant after it's not an innovation anymore and it's already in reality. That's what it feels like to be in the hot seat, making very large deployment decisions about nuclear energy. When you're not in that line, it feels like you want to solve errors through doing something new. Right. When I'm seeing news stories about China making record time on activities in some of their standardized nuclear plants, you read about what the innovations are, and it's things like, this time we used this crane of this large size, but then we also added smaller cranes in order to do this simultaneously. Okay, crane positioning, that's your breakthrough? <laughs> if you love construction, if you love building, which so many of us have from a young age, it's amazing to hear about correct utilization of the right number and size of cranes. That is amazing. And they're going to get it done in four or four and a half years. And it's part of a program that may have taken eight years. And at the end, at the end you're producing, a, you're turning on a reactor per year at a mega plant. That's awesome. That's good enough for me. And what we're doing with the SMRs is in many ways, we're so decrepit in our abilities that we're restarting from the beginning. And why would we be doing something that we're bad at? Because nothing else provides what nuclear energy provides. The advantages of having the densest fuel in the world with the advantages of almost no environmental impacts. Hmm. That's why it's worth struggling. Uh, you know, that's why it's worth rebooting our nuclear industry anywhere that it needs energy, which is effectively everywhere. It's just a matter of admitting to ourselves that we're building small because we're bad at building big, admitting to ourselves that as soon as we build it well small, we're going to want to size it up exactly like you said, 
And yeah. that's okay. That's how we got good at building nuclear in the first place. We built smaller and then we sized up. And I feel like this always chasing the new thing, maybe we've been conditioned by the semiconductors industry and by software and all that, that things are going up Moore's laws and always improving and getting so much better. But nuclear power isn't on that kind of curve, right? If we just took a reactor that was built in 1980 and made a, you know dozens and dozens of them all around Europe and the US, that'd be great too, right? That we wouldn't lose much by doing that than by building the latest design. Uh, some things, of course, have improved a lot, but the amount of clean nuclear power that would be gotten there would still be fine, right? It, was, it would still work. As shown by the plants built back then that are still operating great today. Like we talked in part one about the, the ship of Theseus. Yeah, we, I mean, the dream of a module plant where almost everything that's like metal and has nuclear material inside can be pulled in or pulled out. I guess that's the, you may even have permanently higher costs potentially, but as long as they're predictable and you know exactly what you're spending money on, how much you're spending for what output, this again may require not having these stupid electricity markets that can't conceive of longer than 10 years at a time. So if you have a technology that's the correct long-term capital investment, it may very well be worthless trash to the market designed intentionally to ignore long-term capital efficiency. That is of no account. It's about marginal cost today to turn on. That's it. Now, we've added in some markets like uh, mechanisms, like I referenced, the epicycles on epicycles. We've added a capacity mechanism to try to induce long-term power plant being there. But they have their problems too. And the market purists, the market believers, the people who help design these things say, these capacity markets are dumb. You should have the purity because then people, you're removing the fear that drives this correct long-term capital deployment of building enough nuclear plants. Yeah, but that fear only, if you're a firm, acts out of individual firm fear that there won't be enough power and builds a power plant, and then you're wrong, your firm individually goes down, but not the grid. When all the firms see it as not their problem to make sure that the whole grid stays up. So much of the potential problems get externalized to society in general, and some little firm can't bear on its shoulders people freezing in winter or national sovereignty being diminished or you know all these geopolitical problems. Like, there's so much stuff that you can't reflect in these markets and some commodities price that should still be taken into account that, yeah, I, it's, it's a market failure. So what technologies am I excited about? Because it's, it's not just all doom and gloom. I think that although some designs are not the ones I would gravitate towards as an engineer, if enough people get behind them, then you can move forward. Will the performance be good? Maybe, might even be better. I'm not saying I don't think new designs won't have great performance. Some of them may actually have performance breakthroughs. By necessity, we've lost, <laughs> we have to do some things new because we've lost the ability to do the old in many ways. So maybe some of those new things end up better than before. Maybe we'll have the nuclear equivalent of the reusable launching rockets that Elon Musk and his team at SpaceX have developed. We're still needing to see the long-term economics of that, but assuming that what appears to be the case, which is a sharply lowered launch cost, assuming yep. that's borne out over the longer term, then we could see in nuclear our own version of that really important breakthrough that almost required a total split with the ways of doing things of the past in order to even conceive of that as being an option. So we might get that on nuclear. One of the reactors that I think is most fascinating is also one of the most ancient. It's derived from the very oldest reactor designs. And that is the CANDU, the Canadian uh. Deuterium Uranium Reactor. So the idea of the CANDU was for a nation like Canada that did not have and was not planning to get uranium enrichment technology. That's where you take natural uranium from the earth purify it to make it just the, the metal or the metal oxide. And then you have two flavors of this uranium that shows up in the earth. One is the dominant flavor, uranium-238, 99.3% of your uranium is going to be that slightly chubbier atom. And then 0.7% of natural uranium is going to be uranium-235, slightly slimmer version. That slightly slimmer version is a little bit unstable. Mm -hmm. And it breaks down over time. And by over time, I mean over the life of our solar system. So it's been going away for as long as the Earth has been here, that uranium-235 has been fading away a bit. Right, so that part does really well in reactors. We'll leave the physics aside. If you don't have the ability to selectively increase the proportion of that uranium-235, a process called enrichment, then 
you need a reactor that is unbelievably efficient at economizing and getting the most out of each neutron that comes out of a uranium-235 split and make sure that that neutron is highly likely to find itself back in a uranium atom splitting apart and make more neutrons that can split more uranium. So the way they design the reactor is to have a modular core, as in the core itself, where all the neutrons are going around and the, and the nuclear reaction is taking place, is modular. It's a series of small tubes, about this big, uh, what, seven or eight inches, called calandria tubes, and these have pressurized water running through them, taking away heat from the fuel. The fuel is it comes in bundles that you can carry in your hand. I mean, the bundles are like a foot and a half long, half a meter long, let's say. And these bundles are being constantly loaded and unloaded from these long skinny channels. Why would you do such a weird system? Well, it means you have a reactor that can run 1,000 days in a row. And in many ways, it shuts down only for um, little repairs or checkups. Yeah. So you have a system also that because each bit of the core is modular and replaceable, you can substitute it out after 30, 35 years in a big refurbishment. The refurbishment can take a few years, cost a billion or two, and then you have effectively another 30 to 35 years of life on your reactor. All the other parts can also be replaced. Now, here's the interesting thing for me if we were going to expand world nuclear. You're going to end up with a lot of bottlenecks. That's the bottlenecks that we were referring to without using the word in Europe. If Europe wanted to go in parallel towards nuclear, what would be the holdups? Yep. What would not be manufactured in the continent? What would you need to order from abroad? But what if they were also hmm. trying to expand nuclear? And some of the largest components are the ones that the fewest number of metallurgical facilities of machine shops can actually work with. There are almost no forges on planet Earth big enough for the large modules of some of the modular reactor designs. You see the issue here? Yeah. You may say modular, but if the biggest module has stuff on a critical path of a severe industrial bottleneck, there's a limit to growth. And if you can remove the most number of the biggest bottlenecks, then you have a system that might be reproducible with to high standards in emerging economies with cheap labor but good engineers. That brings us to India. India uses this reactor design, their own version of it. So if you had an Indian supply chain with outstanding engineers from the IITs and their technical training institutes, but at Indian engineering costs, and you had small parts that can be certified and checked to meet Western standards, as I believe they would probably find, because uh, even developing countries are very, very serious about their nuclear, about their nuclear safety standards. I, it's just an international thing. It's like the fact that developing countries don't lose jet planes all the time because it would be bad for Boeing, bad for Airbus, bad for global airlines, bad for the pilots, bad for the customers coming to and from the, the fancy countries. You see my point. Yep. There's a great deal of shared interest in international nuclear, where even during this war, you have experts working together to keep nuclear plants safe outside of, outside of the war zone from countries involved. I'm going to keep some of the th strong thoughts I have about that situation for a uh, different time, different podcast. So if you have a rapidly expandable, by, the, by nuclear standards, supply chain for a reactor where the core itself is modular, and a lot of the other demands are going to be local labor, local concrete construction, supplies that can come from the country itself, then you also have a chance for a lot more localization to build out a fleet in each country that needs more energy. Right, right. And because these reactors have a lower power density from their larger core, meaning less energy per unit volume of the reactor core, it, they also have extraordinary world-class safety standards, both active safety systems and passive. Active meaning somebody has to do a thing or a control switch has to read read that a sensor setting has been exceeded and, and make a change. Well, these reactors have outstanding passive safety because you have a huge amount of time to respond to anything compared to other reactors because there's less power in a, in a, in a given space. Yeah, the more I've learned about the can-do, the more like it checks almost all of the boxes of a lot of claiming advanced nuclears, right? So even apparently it's it's a particularly good design to produce radioisotopes for medicine and sterilizing equipment and radiotherapy. I think it's cobalt 60, right? So that, that kind of stuff is extremely useful. Because you're loading and unloading constantly, it becomes possible to vary the amount of time you have access to the core. Now, this does make it a worry 
for proliferation. What do I mean by that? If you're constantly loading and unloading uranium fuel, you will be producing some amount of plutonium. If you also then develop the ability to process that spent fuel, you can presumably separate out plutonium and, and use it for a weapons program. One of the advanced nuclear companies that I find most fascinating, and full disclosure, they're a client of mine, I work with them, they're based in Chicago where I live, is a company intending to put thorium hmm. plus enriched uranium in these reactors. And the goal is to reduce the refueling rate by a factor of seven and mm. also reduce the spent fuel, you know, the spicy radioactive spent fuel that has to be monitored and kept separate from humans and the environment. The amount of that is cut by a factor of seven. Oh, wow. And that spent fuel has essentially no plutonium in it. And much of the power comes from breeding and then burning thorium into uranium-233 as you go. What's the name of that company? Clean Core Thorium Energy, based in Chicago, Illinois. You can find them on Twitter at Clean Core Thorium Energy. And so the concept here is you want advanced nuclear. Candu ticks almost all the boxes. You take the weaknesses, the worst weaknesses of Candu, and you can convert them to strengths. And then you have potentially, if India is interested in this, and I believe they should be, exporting their own small modular Candu with a production system that can not just be expanded quickly, but also localized because their parts are much smaller to build small modular reactors with advanced modular cores fueled by a fuel that should alleviate much of the proliferation concern while offering substantial operational cost advantages due to reducing the need to constantly fuel and unfuel the reactor. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Hmm. This aspect of Candu was one that surprised me when I learned about it, but this kind of like flex fuel aspect where it can burn uranium, non-enriched, can burn thorium. It can even apparently burn, you know, reprocessed materials from nuclear weapons that have been dismantled. Many reactors can do that. What's kind of fun is that Candu reactors can deal with material essentially straight from operating pressurized water reactors. From the main types of reactors, that material, when it's not radioactive enough to work or it's not radioactive in the right way enough mm. to work in, in traditional reactors anymore, it can go to Canadian <laughs> reactors and then be reused. We don't do that because, you know, the uranium is pretty cheap and it's just not necessary, yeah. but it becomes a possibility. Yeah, in a world where if we imagine a much bigger planetary fleet of reactors, having these kind of recycling plants in a way could be part of the process, right? So that's another question I suppose we ask, is nuclear truly renewable? Is nuclear, if used to meet the world's energy needs at the standard of living of Europe of two, 2021 and before, maybe not 2022 and after, but 2021 and before, if reactors are meeting that standard of living and providing both heat and electricity for all industrial needs, and let's say we had 10 billion people, how quickly would we use up the uranium supply? Well, you would use up the currently in production supply pretty quickly. Then you would use up the uh, various inventories of under enriched material or unenriched material or waste if you reprocessed it. That would last you another few centuries. And at that point, you just start exploring for more uranium. Uranium is not rare, it is just hard to find. That's a very important distinction. Not rare just hard to find, meaning you have to put effort into finding it. And when you find it, you can find it in really rich ore patches, really rich. And then you mine it specifically. Yeah. And if you truly run out, you start using more of that thorium. You start using ocean uranium. Uranium is, you know, dissolves from rocks around the world, often sedimentary rocks where it's been deposited over time where water's flown. And then it flows again to the ocean. And then it gets spread around the ocean waters. And then you can extract it from ocean waters using a special kind of sponge. Uh, we haven't needed to develop that process because uranium is just too cheap. But if you wanted to supply 10 billion people's worth of electricity and heat energy for a long time, you end up with several billion years of <laughs> nuclear fuel from ocean water. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Like just if we even forget uranium, just just thorium from seawater, if we got to that and had to just you know filter it out somehow, that that would be like millions and millions and possibly billions of years. Or that. So it's at this point, it's more like we are not fuel limited. Let's just say we are not. We're imagination limited. 
how long until we have fusion, right? So that, that's another topic. But at some point in the future, we may not even be talking about fission as much, right? Fusion may work. But think about this. Fusion doesn't really deliver a big bump over fission because if your fuel costs are already de minimis yeah. and not quickly, <laughs> not tightly linked to the price of nuclear energy, then the gains from having a little bit better are almost nothing. If we invent a type of light bulb that's more energy efficient than LED, it will do almost nothing for global energy demand. Why? Because we've already got that down to a bit of an asymptote. In the United States, lighting from you know, domestic lighting, if it were all LEDs, would be a vanishing fraction of total energy needs in households, 1% or less. That's a good point. That's, that's the thing, right? When I started hearing about fusion, it was like, oh, it's the holy grail, right? Because it's like nuclear, but with all, all the downsides of nuclear. But then when you learn more about fission, you're like, well, those downsides have been exaggerated a lot. The waste is not much of a problem. It's more about the construction costs. And fusion is not going to be cheaper than fission, at least not as, as far as the eye can see, right? Well, Liberty, one of the amusing things about getting a little closer on fusion is that I've seen a decline in the narrative that an advantage of fusion over fission is that the reaction is so unstable that it just shuts down easily. Hmm. Because, you know, that's only a good argument if you don't need energy. Right. Or if it doesn't need to be reliable. Or you don't actually have a facility that's in production. Right. And furthermore, shutting down the reaction is just not the hard part of nuclear fission. It's removing decay heat if an event of the violence and magnitude to require emergency shutdown also damages the ability to do emergency cooling. That's the problem with fission. Yeah, I think that's what I found so cool about when I, one of the first designs I read about was the lifter, right? The liquid fluoride thorium reactor where they had this plug that's kind of kept cold. And then if there's ever total loss of power, then passively this plug melts and all of the liquid molten salt drains to a holding tank underground by gravity. And those kinds of designs are extremely elegant. The other designs are already extremely safe, so you may not even need to go all the way there. But the amount of thinking that goes into making these nuclear power plants safe, I think most ordinary people underestimate how many processes and mechanisms there are. It was an obsession with safety, both real and imaginary, from a position of what now turns out to be unsafety, the assumption that we had enough energy, the assumption that we had enough electricity, even in the short term. That assumption is gone this winter. Yep. One other thing that's come up lately, uh, there's just been a big announcement by Dow and X Energy about building a SMR, but not only for electricity, but building it on site in the Gulf Coast chemical plant for heat too. It feels like almost, it's kind of under the radar how much energy is produced, not for electricity, but for heat for all kinds of industrial processes. And that's another place where nuclear is one of the only solutions, I feel like, for decarbonization. Because if you're not going to burn fossil fuels to get that energy and heat, like what else are you going to do? You're not going to get it from wind turbines and <laughs> solar panels. Well, the proposal was you could. You have so many extra wind turbines and hmm. solar panels, so much vast overproduction in times of surplus. You're still down to zero at nighttime for solar, and, and you're still down to extremely low over whole continents if there's a wind drought. But the idea is you would build so much that on average there would be an oversupply. Then you would take that oversupply, use it to split water to make hydrogen, to name hmm. one of the technologies to make hydrogen. Then you would use the hydrogen and store it and then recombine it in various industrial processes for both heat at high temperature flames and to use the hydrogen in itself, perhaps to form synthetic hydrocarbons by combining with carbon, perhaps captured from CO2 and also itself broken down using extra energy. Yeah, right. So if you do this system, you end up with energy efficiencies of conversions that are absolutely pathetic. And you're working a lot with hydrogen, which is one of the most annoying and yeah. fortunate gas molecules you could possibly work with because it is the smallest. It is a pain in the ass for engineers. doesn't mean we can't. doesn't mean we don't even need to if we're going to go full nuclear. It's just you want to avoid it where you can. Right. So if that was the proposal for wind and solar, imagine the relief if you could just guarantee high or pretty high heat all the time from a nuclear reactor or barring that, if you have a lower temperature reactor like our present day water-cooled reactors that are mostly topping out at 300 degrees, uh, centigrade. So if you have those reactors, you can use the electricity. Now, you've asked about the X Energy reactor that Dow Chemical has made an announcement with. That would be a gas cooled reactor where the fuel are these almost indestructible pellets, ceramic pellets, where there's a ceramic coating 
around ceramic coated smaller pellets within. So it's layers within layers within layers, almost like a gumball. I don't know if you have that that candy yeah. in, in Canada, but you know, it's like one of those everlasting gobstoppers, but the interior are little, little tiny, tiny little grains of uh, enriched uranium. So the idea being that these plants, you could walk away and they would just sit there and glow red hot for a while, but none of the, none of the uh, ceramic pellets would break down. Yeah. So then hot gases would throw, flow through these big pellets, these pebbles, and those hot gases would get to levels that start to be really attractive for direct use in many different chemical processes. Or you can have those gases and ha add a bit more energy to them using electricity, and then you can get arbitrarily high temperatures. Hmm. And if you're not converting the majority of this hot gas into electricity, then you're retaining 50, 60% extra energy, depending on which temperature of gas. Maybe for the highest temperature gas processes, you're losing about 40% of the energy in that gas to convert it to the highly ordered, easy to handle electricity. If you just don't do that, then you end up with uh, you know, the solution to decarbonizing the industrial world. Yeah, and that seems to be a much better use for SMRs than the power grid. Maybe you might want them large too. If you get them to work right, yeah. you'll want those bigger too. Yeah, it depends what kind of industrial cluster you have and what scale you need. But in many places, right, they won't build a gigawatt reactor. But yeah, if you think of the alternatives there, seems like a no-brainer to go that way rather than the Rube Goldberg machine of like, let's overbuild a ton of this and once in a while we just won't be able to operate the plan and we'll be losing tons of power to conversion from, you know, meh, I don't know. But we'll see, that's the rational thinking, right? The emotions, I don't know. Maybe industrial is less emotional. That's your problem, Liberty. You're so emotional. You're throwing out this renewable thing that's working so well and you're trying yeah. to get some completely different system. Instead, if you've accepted that only renewables are the way forward and you're only looking at the next marginal change and you see industrial heat as this colossal thing that holds up civilization, but it's on the horizon, it's further off, and you've forgotten to check and see whether you have to do that to decarbonize, which yes, you do. <laughs> and you've forgotten to see if you have to keep doing that in order to survive in a rich world, yes, you do, then you can just say, we're just dealing with the next 1% of electricity generation. That's all just next 1%. And somebody says, there's industrial heat lurking at the end. And you're thinking, ah, well, let's just um, produce three or four times as much renewable electricity as we need, and then we'll convert that to hydrogen and convert that to industrial heat. Nah, people are wonderful. They aren't worth that. <laughs> not at the global level. They, I, I'm not even saying that as a as a normative statement i'm just saying that 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 literally ignore money people are not teaming up and making themselves worth enough to do energy at that level of inefficiency and still have the benefits of industrial civilization and we were pushing the limits this year on how much people are worth how much heat is worth to a government is a government willing to mortgage its future sell all of its family jewels to buy consumables to make it through this winter without losing some percentage of its elderly and young. How hmm. grim, how awful. Yet those are the considerations facing developing countries at even part of the level of price that we're seeing now. How much is it worth it to a nation to back the trading firms or, or the, the national energy companies to buy a cargo of LNG at a given price if you know that that's what it takes. You have to buy that LNG to keep this number of people alive or to keep growing the economy and not have immense suffering that leads to the downfall of whole governments. Those are the choices we're facing. It's just a lot of countries that we're developing will no longer be. And a lot of the countries that were developed will find that it's not a permanent status. Yeah, back to the depressing part, right? It's so sad that a lot of the narrative and the lack of vision that we have is about it's almost we're playing defense, right? So, oh, like, let's try not to lose what we have, right? Let's try to replace this part. Let's use less of this. Let's... I wish we had the vision to be like, you know, what we need is to be better, to have more abundance, right? If you have plenty of cheap and clean power, you can do large scale desalination and irrigation and you can make some deserts bloom and food can be cheaper, right? Even using nuclear to displace gas on the grid makes natural gas cheaper, all is equal. So now fertilizer and other uses of industrial uses of gas, you'll make it make those things cheaper, food is cheaper. All that stuff helps the poor, helps like this is making the world better, right? Yeah, I wish people would see if it. If I'm choosing a team, if I am tasked with decarbonizing and I'm choosing a team of people to work with, I'll take any day, I'll take somebody who thinks it's a scam, but believes in abundance. 
over somebody who thinks that global warming is and climate change are totally happening, but doesn't believe in abundance. Why? Because you can't build the systems necessary with somebody who doesn't believe in abundance. You just can't get them to understand the necessity of sacrificing to build today, to provide in large amounts for tomorrow. Right. What if people 50 years ago had all believed like Malthus and all that and said, oh, it's, it's all going to crap anyway. It's never going to work. We get like how many? Aha. See, let me stop you there. Enough believe that eventually those ideas took hold and justified destructive capital burning management systems for the grid. So they did win. And yeah. we're seeing the we're seeing the returns now. Yeah, that's the, the, the Churchill phrase, right? About how we're going to try everything, uh, try uh all the wrong things until we have left no choice but to do the right thing or whatever it was That's close enough you can trust america to always do the right thing once it is exhausted all of exactly options. that's the one i was looking for but it, look that's one of those phrases you can turn it around to almost every single government because eventually yeah. they'll have some big fixed idea over the long term that drives them into trouble so i think it, i think it may even be apocryphal but we can check right We've been talking for a while now and uh, I want to let you go. But before you go, I'm curious if you could have like, you know, if you had a magic wand, if you had a genie, if you had whatever those things and you could change just a few things, like a handful of policy changes around the world or even just in Europe or the US, like what kind of tweaks would you make to the system right now to make the biggest difference? Where's the most leverage? One thing on the electricity markets, there should be, I don't know, Uh, speaking in these religious terms, uh, God's share or, you know, the church's share of electricity where the government does extremely long-term planning for ultra secure supplies of electricity. And let's maybe, what is that going to be? 50% if you want to be risky, maybe 75% if you want to be safe, where that 75% of electricity just is taken care of by ultra long-term planning of the most absolutely secure fuels and absolutely secure facilities. Of course, I think that should be nuclear. You end up with something like the 75% French nuclear that they are now wasting, right? But you'd mm. have that. And boy, now that France has mismanaged so much nuclear, they certainly value what they have left. Let's see if they can pull it out. So I would make that change. Even if there's such thing as electricity markets, they need to be for that wild, wild west final 25% or 15% or 10% or whatever. So there's a reserve, a national park of the reactor energy, and then a reserve bit just to keep everybody a little honest with the remaining portion. I think that almost everybody who is invested in renewables needs to take a massive haircut because it turns out that those aren't, although they are the correct thing on average in some ways during an energy crisis of fuels, the process by which they were constructed eliminated the correct decision making. You see, it's a little bit subtle. I'm not saying, especially in a crisis, tear down the wind turbines and solar panels that already exist, just they were built using decision making that was extremely damaging to the thing that was actually necessary. The right. solid fuel energies like coal and nuclear. And if you add the environment as one of your goals, coal's out too. Right. That's the thing, right? There's not 98 choices. Once you start going down the list, you're not left with that much if you want something that's the this safety net you're talking about, right? Below which you can't go. You need something that's super reliable, that's local, right? Because gas is like If you have plenty of gas like the US, okay, gas can be secure in some ways. But if you're like Europe and you depend on a neighbor for gas and this neighbor is Russia, well, eh. so I agree. If it seems like there should be this bedrock below which society cannot fall because the consequences are just too great. Right? But you will always need a religious level of faith, a religious belief in that needing to be maintained because you won't be able to prove it at any time. At any point, people will come and say on the margin, we should do a little bit of something else. Or on the margin, it would make sense for some other entity or some other process to come in. And you have to be careful of that erosion. That's the way the French descent started, really. Yeah, if we want to see the silver lining of the situation now, hopefully in the same way that you know, the Second World War has stayed with a generation for a long time and they made decisions based on how bad things could be. Hopefully the energy crisis now is going to color the next 50 years or something and we won't let it get back to that level if we you know, get out of it. Yeah, we need to see a Mediterranean refocus, uh, be a, again, 
a source of great energy trade with a ring of nuclear power plants along the ocean, all also connected to industrial facilities that produce the goods that keep us alive. I think that would be a beautiful vision. The Russians are kindly starting that with two giant nuclear plants in the ancient part of the Mediterranean. So the southern coast of Turkey and the uh, northern coast of Egypt. Yeah, mainly one coast, but <laughs> the northern coast of Egypt, just west of Alexandria, immense nuclear plants going in there. So the start is there. I guess I have to ask what's going to be the European response. Yeah. So that's a big one. I don't, I don't know if I have other recommendations, perhaps ones like a reintroduction of quality energy curriculum starting hmm. at a relatively young age. Uh, there's a lot of people now working in something you could call progress studies where they have an emphasis on history, especially history of technology. I think that would be a valuable and fascinating way to especially keep uh, young kids interested in schooling in a time of lowering horizons, lowering living standards, which we have to get through to come back on the other side. And I think within nuclear itself, I want much more attention to beauty and to imagination and creativity in telling and showing the story of nuclear energy. And if that is even just internal rituals. So uh, when refueling is done at a nuclear plant, there should be feasts. Feasts on a, again, a religious scale. There should be feast days dedicated to the return of a reactor to regular operation. When all the high pressure, hard hours are done, there needs to be an actual celebration that, depending on the interests or the ambitions of the nuclear plant and their host community, should become regionally, nationally, or even internationally famous as a once every 18 years harvest, the equivalent of a harvest festival where people, maybe a lot of people are going to get really drunk, but it does, you don't have to have too much <laughs> alcohol. A lot of nuclear workers are not heavy drinkers, so maybe that doesn't fit. But where there's a celebration of return to operation of this great energy combine, this great energy harvester, I think that would be a great step forward for the nuclear industry. I like that because we take so many important things for granted, right? Even indoor plumbing or that kind of stuff. And even making nuclear plants look better, right? If they all look like Diablo Canyon, I think that would be a good start. I have to say that Diablo Canyon still has that ugly, untreated concrete exterior on the, on the containment structure. It's mainly benefiting from a gorgeous natural, yeah, natural setting. It's the landscape. And it's maybe the landscape. kind of a cool surface treatment on the generator building, turbine, turbine hall. Cool. Well, this, this has been great. I think we've covered so much in, in these two parts. I think my brain is going to have a meltdown now. There's been so much load in there. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm going to put in the show notes all of your links to social and all the links that you mentioned at the end of part one. Thank you so much. Have a good day. All right. Thanks, everybody.